Hi and welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Vince. Thanks for stopping by. You're very welcome here indeed. So an interesting study out of the Duke University School of Nursing covering an anti-aging study that stretches all the way back to babies that were born in the 1970s. So enough waffling off me. Let's jump into the presentation and let's see what this long term study on anti-aging has got to offer. This is a review of a piece written by Sarah Avery of the Duke University School of Nursing. She says people grow older at different rates, regardless of what the calendar says. And for those whose bodies age more quickly, the cumulative effect could show up as early as midlife, when signs of dementia and physical frailty begin to emerge. The findings were published in the journal Nature Aging and suggest that identifying and treating the diseases of aging should begin around the time people celebrate their 45th birthday. This is before problems escalate, degrade people's quality of life and possibly impose huge costs on people and on society. The lead author, Maxwell Elliott, who is a PhD student in Duke's Department of Psychology and Neuroscience said, aging isn't something that happens suddenly when people reach their 60s. It is a lifelong process. We have a way of measuring how quickly people are aging and our findings highlight the importance of addressing biological aging in midlife while prevention is possible and before heavy organ damage has accumulated. The researchers, including senior author Terry Moffat, a professor in psychology and neuroscience, created a unique database using a study that was started in New Zealand in the 1970s. The Dunedin study enrolled 1,037 babies born in 1972 and 1973, and more than 90% of the participants are still enrolled, and they continue to participate in periodic health measurements. Among the data gathered over the years are biomarkers for changes in heart, kidney, lung and immune system functions, as well as dental health, mental acuity and physical abilities. Duke researchers in early studies used 19 distinct health factors collected regularly among this group to establish a means of measuring the biological aging process. Maxwell Elliott also said, the benefits of using this cohort for studying aging data is that everyone is the same age and we are able to measure them over decades using the same biomarkers. By assigning an aging rate to the study group based on the biomarkers for organ health, the researchers found that some of the 45 year olds aged at a rate that was slower than the average for their chronological age. These slow aging participants looked younger their faces had fewer wrinkles, they remained mentally sharp, their cardiovascular health was good, and they continued to walk at a brisk pace. On the other end of the spectrum were 45 year olds who had aged more rapidly. These people looked older, showed signs of cognitive decline as measured in their IQ scores, felt less healthy, and even tended to have a pessimistic attitude about aging. By midlife, people who had aged more rapidly were already at risk of developing frailties that impaired physical and their financial independence. Professor Terry Moffat, a professor in psychology and neuroscience said, our analysis shows that the pace of aging is a strong indicator of the cumulative, progressive and gradual deterioration across organ systems that underlie biological aging. These findings demonstrate that meaningful variations in biological aging can be measured and quantified in midlife, providing a window of opportunity for the mitigation of age-related diseases. Elliot also noted that the earlier interventions to slow the speed of aging would have benefits for both individuals and broader society. In the USA, and I'm sure in other countries too, social services, including Medicare and Social Security, are based on our chronological age and kick in in later life. But people who have an accelerated rate of biological aging will have age-related disabilities earlier and may need to access this support earlier also. Early interventions could save lives. They could preserve quality of life 
and reduce healthcare costs as well as other age-related costs too. The report didn't seem to take into account epigenetics. Did those people who had poor outcomes suffer from environmental or personal factors such as pollution, diet and smoking? I doubt that all 137 babies went on to live in the same town and all ate the same diet, got the same amount of sun exposure and all did or did not smoke or drink alcohol equally. That said, I think this study is extremely interesting, but I don't think governments are going to embrace it. The idea of bringing in age-related medical and financial support, such as assisted living facilities, to people who need it when they may be in their 40s, I think will be a bridge too far for many politicians to want to attempt to cross. So I hope you found that interesting or informative, hopefully both. Uh, as you know, we all age differently. We accumulate different age-related diseases at different times during our lives, and we all die at different ages. But in America, and I'm sure in other countries too, you're only eligible for Medicare at the age of 65. Looking at this long-term study or the results of the study, that could be 20 years too late for quite a lot of people. So that's 20 years of looking, acting, and feeling like an older person, possibly needing help, but not being able to access it because of the date on your birth certificate. And as David Sinclair says, your age should not be dictated by the amount of times that our earth has gone around the sun. So if politicians and governments are not gonna do anything about this, and the evidence to date is that they're not, what are we as individuals or citizen scientists, what can we do about it? I think epigenetic testing is one route we could go down find out our epigenetic or biological age compared to our calendar age, and then make the necessary changes to lifestyle, exercise, diet, etc., to get us back on track. As David Sinclair says, genetics is only 20% of the game. 80% of what we do dictates how long and how healthy we live for. And as he also says, what are you gonna do about it today?